Hello, everybody. I think we are live. Welcome to our Boston Court conversation about what makes a Boston Court play. We are so happy to have you joining us for this uh, first live virtual Boston Court event. And um, so uh, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started here. So uh, as I said, this is a conversation about what makes a Boston Court play with uh, Boston Court Artistic Director, Jessica Kabzanski. Uh, give, give us a wave, Jessica, excellent. And uh, literary manager and director of new play development, Emily Beck. And I am Margaret Shigiko Starbuck, the Artistic Associate at Boston Courts, and I'm going to be moderating today's event. Uh, and so I just want to start off by saying this is our first foray with Crowdcast and live streaming. And so uh, we are planning that everything goes perfectly smoothly. Uh, but uh, we, we might have a few technical glitches along the way. Some Wi-Fi might cut out. So please just bear with us. If anything goes wonky for a second, uh, we will rejoin you shortly. Uh, and I wanted to start off by giving a brief overview of how today's event is going to go. Uh, so first off, you cannot be seen or heard if you are an audience member. Uh, you can communicate with us through the chat on the right hand side of your screen, but don't worry if you're wearing sweatpants and using a blender very loudly. We will not be able to see or hear any of your activities. Um, and so we're going to kick things off with Jessica and Emily answering some frequently asked questions about what makes a Boston Court play and what we look for when we read script submissions uh, and kind of the mission of Boston Court. Uh, and that's going to take about 20 minutes. And then we will move on to answering your questions. So you can ask us questions in the chat or using the ask a question feature at the bottom of your screen. And we will do our best in the second 20 minutes of the event to answer as many of your questions as possible. We would love to hear from you. Uh, so please ask away. Uh, and uh, this event is going to be recorded and the plan is that we will be releasing the recording on our social media. Uh, so if anybody you know missed the live event and really wants to see it, can check in with us on social media and you will likely be able to see a recorded version of the event. And. Um, Lastly, I just wanted to say we are so happy to have you all with us. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jessica. Hi, friends. Oh, my God. It's so great to see you, even as little chat boxes. Um, it's just so thrilling to be in an interaction with you. And I see some of your individual shout outs, and I will say hello to all of you. But um, mostly, what a joy to be in community with the Boston Court homies, um, especially in this moment. It's an especial thrill. I hope you are all not only surviving, but managing to thrive in these weirdest of times. Um, you know, it is, I think, personally, the strangest moment I have certainly ever lived through in my life. And I'm not 12 anymore. I know that will come as a shock to all of you. Um, and. Uh, so it's really exciting to just be able to connect to you in the Corona times. So uh, what a thrill and hello and welcome. And just to say, you know, Boston Court is very busily brainstorming and scheming and thinking of all the ways in which we can literally get outside the box and um, figuratively get outside the box and uh, turn this challenge into an opportunity to continue to kind of create innovative art for you. Um, so that's a little state of the union. Uh, everyone, I, I have spent more time on Zoom platforms in the last, and I've actually spent more time in my home in the last eight weeks than I have in the last eight years. So um, uh, just so you know, that's what's happening on the home front. Um, I think I am now supposed to share a kind of a broad definition slash vision statement 
about what a Boston court play is and then I will stop talking and we will start riffing and conversing. Um, and I'm just gonna laugh at my own self. I put gum in my mouth and forgot to take it out. So I'm gonna do that <laughs> right now. Okay, magic, it's gone. <laughs> Sorry, but that's what happens when we're live, right? Um, okay, um, so, uh, you know, when uh, Michael Petty and I had the privilege of um, starting Boston Court low these, I don't know, 17 years ago or something, and we really talked about what was important to us and what um, seemed to be important if we were going to be a, a new theater, uh, a, a smaller theater in the this four block vicinity of the Pasadena Playhouse, and also what was important to us in terms of our personal passions and aesthetics, um, and maybe what our community needed. We talked about making passionate, now I'm gonna quote the vision statement that that we created low those many years ago, which we still adhere to in many ways. Um, it has some things that we do in it that are no are have never been articulated in the vision. So I'll go on to articulate them, and then we'll go from there. Uh, we do passionate artist-driven plays that challenge both artist and audience. We encourage every artist to passionately pursue their unique voice and vision. And vision. We encompass a wide variety of genres, including significantly re-envisioned classics with a special emphasis on new works and new work development that is inherently theatrical, textually rich, and visually arresting. And that has sort of been our guiding principle for how we choose work over low these many years. And just to expand on that a little bit, it starts with text because we believe in the poetry of the theater. We rarely do naturalism because of an inherent belief that movies do it better. Our productions often utilize nonlinear narratives, direct address, and other non-naturalistic theatrical uh, uh, conventions. But beyond our stylistic and structural preferences, the Boston Court play is one that explores deeply human themes. In the end, we prefer to be talking about ideas brought up in a play rather than its plot. So uh, other things that are really a factor for us, we try really hard to choose a play that will give you an experience that you can't have anywhere else in Southern California that will actually reflect our actual world today that speaks to the moment in our times. And uh, we tend to do a great deal of new work or a significantly re-envisioned classic or very occasionally a classic that is already what we think of as a Boston Court play for instance, Tennessee Williams' Camino Reel is inherently a Boston Court play. Uh, and, um, you know, the scope of work is wide. It's also narrow. It's a very inchoate thing. It's one of those things where those of us who have been working on um, programming and selecting plays for Boston Court for quite some time, we can just say we know it when we see it. And it's a constantly evolving permutation of things that um, speak to us about both inherent theatricality, poetry, and humanity. Um, ultimately, we're always trying to engage the cultural conversation and open your mind and heart. You know, and somebody at a conference recently just reminded me of this great Ben Cameron quote, to elevate the human to the humane. So I think that's a summary of what we're on about. Thank you so oh, much, you. Jessica. That's a wonderful <laughs> overview. Um, I was going to say, Emily, I know that we are opening up our LA Playwrights window for submitting scripts, and that's part of the reason why we're doing this event right now. Um, and so I wondered if you just wanted to give a little brief overview of what that means and kind of what we're thinking about in the midst of this pandemic as we're opening that. Yeah, I mean, I want to uh, just add uh, one thing to what Jess was saying uh, that that is always in our conversation. So it's it's something that that Jess and I and everyone talk about all the time, which is that we're also really interested in voices that are not heard, not served, the underrepresented voices, um, whether that's uh, the playwright or the story. Um, we are always looking for the the story that isn't getting uh, out into the mainstream. Um, 
And I want to talk about two, just for a second, this idea of inherent theatr theatricality and, and the way in which it is different from the literal um, approach of movies or TVs or in fact, uh, TV shows, or in fact, like uh, many plays that we do see in other theaters. That is, there's a pursuit of naturalism, which involves a unit set, a chronological timeline, um, uh, uh, an agreement that we're going to watch characters on, on stage converse with each other and not with us. And I think one of the things that Boston Court is really interested in is this agreement that the audience makes coming into the theater, this agreement that we're going to, the suspension of disbelief, we're going to believe the illusion that you place before us. We want to go on this ride. And Boston Court is really interested in, well, if that's the case, what's the ride? You know, how far can we go and how much can we push on that? And can we bend time and can we travel around the earth? Can we sail in the cosmic ocean? You know, there are a lot of plays that you can, a lot of places that you can go to when you are not restricted by a sense of, well, this is the way things are supposed to be. There's supposed to be four chairs at a table and they all face each other. And we want to bust open those doors and see what else we can do because we can. Um, which is not to say that we don't enjoy a, a good naturalistic play every once in a while, just at, at someone else's theater. Um, uh, so I do want to talk about, yes, this, uh, we opened this submission window. We've been doing this for the past several years, um, uh, opening a window to LA playwrights in particular. Uh, for a long time, we, um, we were receiving plays uh, that were coming, and we still do. We receive plays from agents and from playwrights who we've worked with and, and from directors, and, and we get them from across the country. But, you know, there's so many playwrights in Los Angeles, and we realized that we were not meeting as many of them as we wanted to. And so we opened up this submission window several years ago, and it's been amazing we've gotten to know so many people in our community and and gotten to know their work and seen their work over the years um and so uh you know this whole um coronavirus really threw a wrench in everything in our programming in in everything but what we have time for now is to read and so we're really excited to uh, to see what everybody is thinking about, what they're writing about, and and maybe that's something new, and maybe it's something that's been in a desk drawer for a long time and suddenly has a new kind of resonance or a new kind of call to the writer. Um, so we encourage you to check out our guidelines because the guidelines are important um, and uh, submit to us within the next two weeks. We will accept the first 80 plays that are submitted to us. Um, and then what happens is we start reading and we have our artistic team of the three of us who you see before you and also uh my wonderful uh literary intern richard via we are all reading and discussing and um and we look forward to reading your words and and if anybody has any questions they should definitely put them in the chat yes yeah. please if anyone if there are any playwrights watching who have questions about what we're looking for in more detail or how to submit or anything Thing like that please give it give us a shout out in the chat or the question function and go ahead. jessica go ahead yeah i was just gonna say emily i kind of love what you just mentioned because it's so true and i'm sure you all as people who are either passionate theater goers or makers have experienced this is that plays change over time with time as time changes you know and um it is kind of shocking how plays that we look at in, a, in, a, in one time have radically different meanings when the world has changed. And I've had that experience in sort of both ways, meaning suddenly a play seems undoable that we loved before um, because it's politics or the ways tropes that were appropriate at the time have become wildly inappropriate. And conversely, 
um, plays that were of some sort of, for instance, if I were choosing this moment, existential depth and asking questions about um, the end of the world as we know it are suddenly ridiculously relevant. So it is, it's been fascinating to us over the years, like a play that we did in a reading series and then came back to a few years later, the world had radically changed and it had changed our experience of sharing it between our reading series and the performance. And so um, that is one of the many things that, you know, it's interesting that plays at a certain point, people say a work of art is never finished, only abandoned. Um, and so that's true. Eventually the playwright puts it down and says, okay, that's that, but the world can change the play. And that's a fascinating thing that we've discovered over time. Yeah. yeah. I was just thinking uh, this morning about how the light gets in, which which is the play we had done in the fall and which which was universally resonant at the time, but has sort of become even more so because it's about four people who were in isolation, uh, not for the reasons we're in isolation, but still in in very real, you know, isolated lives and who together find a way to be, well, they, they have to be vulnerable with one another in order to find community. And, and you know, I was just thinking about it this morning and thinking about how it, its resonance sort of increased a notch. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful, Emily. I think very well said, both both of you. Um, so I know that we have some like photos of past productions, and I'm wondering if we can just take a look at some of those and maybe dive into a few of them and talk a little bit more in depth about some of those things you mentioned at the top, Jessica, the inherent theatricality, the visually arresting, which I think will be illustrated well through the photos, and also maybe the textual richness in particular that we're looking for. Well, great. Before you start the slideshow, you didn't find anything. Did you include anything from Bars and Measures? No. Okay. Idris Goodwin, I just want to say, Idris Goodwin um, is a really glorious playwright. We did a play of his called Bars and Measures um, a few years ago. Uh, it was a rolling world premiere um, with several other theaters. It's a really beautiful play, and in some way, in some ways really embodies what makes a Boston court play to me. It was very timely. It was, it was actually written in response to um, a newspaper story about uh, two brothers who are musicians. One's a Christian pianist and one's a Muslim jazz musician. The jazz brother has been incarcerated for suspicious activities related to a mosque. He has to teach his, um, his, more straight-laced brother how to kind of scat and take his place in a jazz concert. Um, it's a, it was a highly theatrical treatment with music and um, a very non-realistic set and gorgeous text and really pushing on a quest, the questions of the moment. And um, I mean, so many plays we think of as quintessential Boston court plays. In fact, Cheryl recently had a little giant thing of um, papers in the back hallway in which she asked people to put up sticky notes next to what they thought of as their perfect Boston court play. And interestingly, they were all different. Um, so, um, you know, we really do encompass a wide variety of plays, but if that wasn't a picture, I just wanted to talk about that. Um, cool. Uh, so, and really, I think we're just showing this slideshow because of talking about various in inherently the theatrical elements. So uh, this is an image from the children. If you remember this play, Friends, it was a world premiere that we did by Michael Eliano and I believe 2012, um, which is quite some time ago at this point, but it was sort of a riff on the Medea story where <laughs> um, Medea is, uh, is thinking about killing her children and her, you know, a woman of Corinth steals them away and um, they end up through an accident of the magic book in a hurricane in the middle of modern Maine. But in that play, the children are played by puppets, obviously puppeted by adults who actually play their grown up selves. Um, and as you can see, if you're looking at the images, you know, the puppetry was really significant in this production. 
Um, and it was a really powerful way to talk about childhood and that kind of experience. Yeah, this this play was in so many ways. When we talk about what a Boston Court play is, this this play comes to the top of of our list. Um, it is it's a riff on an ancient play. Um, it is it's got so many theatrical elements. Um, you know, starting with the, with the puppetry, but also leading to I I I don't want to give this away, but at the end there's a huge shift in in reality, and we had to find a way for the uh, lights to lights and set to help us without really moving be completely moved and in a different uh, place altogether. Um, and uh, and the the language of it was gorgeous. Uh, it was a heightened language, and it was funny, and it was also devastating. And um, yeah, there was a really wonderful example of of a Boston Court play. And I think this is an image from uh, Cassiopeia. Yeah. Cassiopeia by David Wiener. And this was a highly poetic play. This was actually written, it looks like a, um, a tone poem on the page. It had two, it had three characters, but two who really spoke in particular. Uh, the man on the left is, uh, his name was Quiet, and he was a, um, a math genius. And he would write, uh, we had his, his floor was in chalk and he would write all over the floor. And then on the other side of the stage is Odette. And between them is a, a river that was made out of the dress of this, um, this character who's known as the voice. Um, there you can see, you can see it there. They, this was a, this was a real mind bending play because it was dealing with uh, the idea of, of ideas of physics. And I, I don't want to uh, go down that rabbit hole right now, but basically these two people are on either side of a chasm. They have met in their lives, but they are so far apart in so many ways. And, and it was about a reaching toward, a reaching across time and space is really what it was. Um, yeah. I'm sure right now we would all love to be reaching across time and space in a variety of ways to connect with one another more um, fully. Yeah. I think we should maybe go through a little more quickly because I don't want to spend the whole time on us just, you know. I was going to say, I actually think now might be a good time to sort of move on to audience questions. Great. Um, Great. So, uh, so we have a couple that have been submitted. And please, everyone, if you have any additional questions, um, feel free to continue asking in the chat and or in the ask a question function and I'll try to keep fielding them as they come up. Um, so it looks like uh, the first question we had uh, was from uh, Siskind and it was, are you thinking of any, I think this is more pertaining to like season planning in the time of COVID-19, are you thinking of any outdoor events or limited audience in the theater or a timeline to get back to normal? Yes, we're thinking of all of those things, actually. Um, and um, I can tell you that we, because Boston Court has this very unique gift of having a parking lot, we are contemplating some parking lot programming. There are a lot of logistics involved. We are contemplating some virtual programming. We are contemplating doing our new play reading festival in the parking lot because we think it's a way that people might feel more appropriately socially distanced. Um, all things are on the table right now. So uh, I'm shy of answering that question specifically because it's a giant discussion right now. But obviously our biggest concern is to make sure everyone feels safe, um, the audience, but also the artists um, and that everyone feels comfortable being in community so that is what's guiding all our thinking right now. And I'm sorry that I can't at this moment say, ta-da, here's our plan. 
but as you know, the world is changing daily. Yes, yeah, it absolutely is. It feels like every day we have a completely new set of, of guidelines and news to, to absorb. Um, so I think we have some sort of practical questions, Emily, that maybe you can help us answer from some playwrights. So one of the questions is, do scripts need to be submitted through an agent or manager? So for the LA Playwright window, no, the playwright can go directly to Submittable and per the guidelines there, submit a script to us. Um, if you are not an LA playwright, then yes, it needs to come through an agent or manager or uh, director, uh, somebody who um, can represent your script to us. Uh, but yeah, if you're an LA playwright, this is the moment. Awesome. Um, and then for the 80 plays we're accepting, that's first come, first serve. That's right. Great. Um, and uh, so then then this is a more, uh, again, sort of like a COVID-19 question. Um, the pandemic is forcing us to confront so many things that we take for granted. So I foresee many playwrights writing new work around this time period. If you have, uh, if you end up receiving submissions that are all inspired by COVID-19, what elements will you be looking for to set those apart? <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, Jessica said earlier when she was talking about reading scripts that we kind of know what we're looking for only when we see it. Um, because these scripts, yeah, right, because these scripts yeah. haven't been written before, because we haven't lived with COVID-19 before, I couldn't begin to tell you. What I What I can say is that all of the things that we've talked about are true. We look for scripts that are inherently theatrical and we look for scripts with deep human resonance. Um, and I, I, I can't imagine that we'll be getting scripts that are the same because we never do. Nobody, nobody yeah. writes like anybody else. So I think the the advice I would give is write, write what's inside you right now. You know, write what's driving you and what's burning inside you because your way of looking at the world is like nobody else's. Awesome. Yeah, and what's interesting is sometimes that play might have nothing specifically to do with the pandemic, but it's the thing that got generated in your heart and soul. Um, that is driving you and really you know it's about obviously it's about artist passion whatever that is and we're always interested in it and you know as emily said the diversity of stories and storytelling is not it's it's a diversity across let's say ethnicity gender race all of those things but it's also diversity in ways stories are told you know there are um as many ways to tell a story as there are humans um, and um, we're interested in those, you know, we talk about plays that have, sorry, we talk about plays that have fractured narratives and all that sort of, that could mean anything. It could mean jumping back and forth in time. It could mean stepping out. It could mean um, sets of characters doing different things at different times. You know, we did a play called Colony Collapse where there was a chorus of parents with missing children by Stephanie Zadrovec and that had sort of a, a chorus of, of parents of missing children and then a kind of a single farm family in the middle of it. So we do so many different kinds of plays and we just encourage you to speak your heart. Yeah, so uh, then in terms of if, if people do submit plays and uh, there's a question, uh, what are exactly are they submitting for? Is it for staged readings, for development, for full production? And then what is the timeline of like your script is under consideration, but for when and for what? That's a great question. Um, we yeah, I think the answer is yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and to be clearer about that, we read, uh, with an eye toward our reading series. Um, new plays often want development. They often want to be heard out loud. They want to, there's so much to discover. And so we want to be a part of helping a, a 
play find its best self. Um, uh, sorry, I seem to have, okay, sorry, I lost the screen for a moment. Um, I, uh, so, so there's the reading series and then beyond that, yes, what we consider for the reading series, we also then consider for, uh, for season, we also sometimes read things that we don't program in the reading series for various reasons. There are all kinds of reasons, but they're then they then go on our list to consider for season. So one does not necessarily mean uh, the other. Um, yeah. right. Sometimes we we have a strong enough sense of what this play is, and we think we'd like to program it. Um, and we don't think we need to hear it aloud. Oftentimes we put plays in the reading series that we are puzzled by, that we think we're unclear about some aspect that will be only helped, especially because we tend to do challenging text and um, not naturalistic text that is just better served by being in the mouths of actors. So the answer is, as Emily says, officially, you know, we open the window prior to our new play reading festival, which is this year will have its culmination in December. But we also have lots of private in-house readings and occasional workshops that are not necessarily for the public to just develop a script So, and full productions. So, you know, it could be any of those things. And just to say, just to be really clear, the December reading series for this year is actually something that we have decided on already. We are talking about having the time now to read for next year, and I don't know when the reading series will be for next year. Yeah. And just to explain, the reading series is decided because we had actually scheduled the reading series in May, <laughs> and we had already chosen the plays and the directors. Um, and then not surprisingly, we had to shutter it. Um, and so it is now moved to December, but that's why that's happening. And I, I, having just attended a virtual TCG conference, you know, the question about what a season means these days and in this particular time is a giant one anyway. So just because we have a reading series in December doesn't mean anything about it, opportunities for us to continue to explore um, new themes, uh, I mean, themes and whether it gets into those particular readings, whether we have room for another play in that series, which we might, um, and uh, many other options. It's, everything's on the table right now. I think the exciting thing about what this time period is forcing us to do is stay nimble and um, not make assumptions about anything. So. And I also, there was another part of that question that had to do with how long until a playwright hears back, which I, I know is the bane of every playwright's, you know, existence. I'm a playwright too, I, I totally get it. Um, uh, and it's a really difficult question. We do try to, within six months, respond to everybody who submits through this submission window. Um, but just to say, we uh, we can consider plays for years. We can keep plays on what we call a hot list or a warm list that we love, that we're interested in. And for some reason, we haven't been able to program them yet. Um, programming a season yeah. is a big puzzle and it involves, as you can imagine, a lot having to do with budget. Um, but also the balance of a season and what we want to represent. And so sometimes there's a play that we can't do one year that we keep hoping that we can do it another year. And so sometimes playwrights don't hear back from us and it doesn't mean the worst thing, you know? It, yeah. it means we're, we don't know what to say yet. Right, we did a reading of Sheila Callahan's um, play, the fashion play as we call it, Everything You Touch which was really thrilling. And we did it in a reading series that was at least two or three years prior to when we actually got a chance to program the play. And that's because if you know it at all, and Margaret, you might actually have a picture of the models, which might be worth sharing at this moment, um, that um, it was so expensive that we wanted to program it. Um, that's a good one, or show the next one if you can. Um, yeah, there's the models in their first crazy uh, fashion 
<laughs> experience. Um, that play had a hundred costumes in it. And in order to afford it, it took us almost two or three years from the time we read it in the reading series to the time we were um, able to actually program it. And then what's really thrilling is that that program, that, that play was a co-production with Rattlestick and we got a chance to share it in New York at Rattlestick uh, at the Cherry Lane. So we actually did the New York premiere as well as the uh, world slash LA premiere of that play after a long time after reading Sheila's play in the reading series. So just as an example, you know, we had a play on the hot list for years that eventually Eric Kobel's My Barking Dog um, ended up in a season. Michael McKetty directed it. Um, it was a play about eco-terrorism, which is, um, you know, ended up having new resonance when we went back to look at it and it had been on our hot list. So just to say, um, it was, um, it's as apropos of plays changing over time and not knowing when your play becomes the thing we have to do is um, just something that is good to know. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, so let's see, I think we have a time for a few more questions here, probably about three more. Um, so there's been several questions, uh, Emily, about the guidelines, specifically about the four character limit. And people are wondering what's the reasoning behind that. And also just to be clear, should they not submit if their play has more than four characters? So to be very clear, if you have more than four characters, but the casting can be doubled so that you only need four actors, then you should still submit. It really has to do with the cost. It has everything to do with budget. Um, and unfortunately, it's not something we like to do, but we really are in a position now where we have to take this quite seriously and, and, and we need your help to recognize that our budget is severely affected um, as we all are by this situation. So we, just to make it more feasible uh, that the plays we read might actually be plays that we program, we put that limit on it. So if you have a way of double casting, um, then you should still submit a multi-character uh, play. And uh, Emily, you are the boss of this. So you can, if, if you feel like you have the perfect play and it has five characters, you can submit it. I, you just need to know that um, in this very financially challenged time, it would sort of necessarily, necessarily put it at the bottom of the list for now. But um, you know, on the theory that we are going to find a way to sort of return to fiscal vibrancy and giant community with each other, you know, if it's the perfect play. I mean, I will say. I, this is something we wrestle with all the time because when we t talk about inherently theatrical, frequently those are much larger cast plays, the casts of seven and more. Um, and so I, I would never want to put a stop on your creativity or writing the play you need to write, which has that many characters in it. You just should know that it's what our challenge is right now. Um, and so maybe there's a moment to share it later or something like that. But just so you're clear, we, we don't want you to chop off the most important character because you're trying to get to the four character limit. We want your play to be what it is. You should just understand what's guiding that, that guideline, which is um, not something we want to do. <laughs> Uh, so then there's a question, by LA playwrights, do you mean LA County or LA area or Southern California? <laughs> well, you know, I feel like if you, if you feel like you could commute to downtown LA for a daily job and that would be a feasible thing for you to do, then you can count yourself as part of LA. Awesome. Yeah, that's a good answer. <laughs> that's a great answer, Emily. Yeah. Um, so then uh, this is really, be, just to be really clear, it's really about making sure we are accessible to our local community. We love playwrights from around the country and we program playwrights from around the country all the time. And by the way, we program amazing LA playwrights as it happens. Sheila Callahan, when I met her, lived in New York. Now she lives in LA. Luis Alfaro lives in LA and we've done two of his plays. and. Um, 
you know, there's a wide variety of amazing LA playwrights. And we just wanted to make sure that um, stay local to grow national was a piece of our brand because that felt important to us. So essentially, this is the opportunity for us to kind of commune with our local. We have such a rich group of playwrights who live in Los Angeles. It's such a gift. Um, we, we just wanted to stay local for this one. So I think this might be in reference to both the TCG conference that Jessica, you mentioned uh, just attending and also just the fact that uh, you obviously as artistic director are meeting with other theater leaders um, amid the COVID-19 crisis to sort of plan yeah. and strategize. Um, so um, communication than we have been ever. Right, yeah. so the question is, what is the most important thing learned from others recently from this kind of uh, interaction with other leaders and what have they responded most to uh, presented by Boston Court play or Boston Court Pasadena representatives? So I think it's the question is what have you learned from them and then what have maybe they taken from you? Uh, I'll just say that maybe the biggest battle cry that I heard recently that, you know, strikes me profoundly, and I'm sure um, this is either going to be completely like, of course, and also, you know, so not radical, but it is about the question about what the new normal is and not, and making sure that the new normal is dismantling systems that are not working. Um, in a wide a variety of ways that limit access, that 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 um, favor privilege, that um, that you know we have to keep breaking down barriers to access to make ourselves more accessible, to make sure we are diversifying the stories and the storytellers and all of those things. So, if I, it feels like everyone sees the pandemic as a kind of call to arms to not simply go back to the way things were and the things that weren't working um, and to take it as an opportunity to make it a, a brave new world. Um, I don't know specifically what Boston Court is bringing to the moment. I will say there are a number of people who were excited about the idea of the parking lot, which is um, delightful. I think, I mean, it is a little bit about literally how one thinks outside the box and how I think what we know is that stories are a part of our lizard brains. They are, um, it feels like it's a basic human need. Um, and I think we are trying to save the world one story at a time. So finding the ways to do that. I mean, I think maybe just the idea of like looking at other spaces and places um, to, uh, to share work, to, to have, take an opportunity to go into our community as opposed to ask the community to come to us. Those are opportunities that I think we have to leap on given where we're at. Absolutely. Amazing. So I think we have time for one last question. Um, and then I think we're going to have to have to be done for today. Um, so the the last question I will close with, I think, is going to be a more pragmatic question. Um, so there are many different kinds of uh, stage play script formats out there. Is there one that we prefer in a submitted script? No, no. In fact, we read uh, all kinds of different formats. Every playwright and every play, I think, has to be written in its own voice. Um, so I know that there's, you know, you can have final draft and it all sort of does it for you. But, you know, a lot of the plays we read are, are in a kind of, the, the form is, is exemplary of what the play is speaking. And as long as we can read it as a play, we don't, we don't have any Margaret? particular needs. Margaret, do you have Sarah's script that you could share? Share. Yeah. I mean, this is definitely not final draft. This is Sarah B. Mantel's Everything That Never Happened. Um, and, um, you know, she has a kind of great poetry in the way she writes. And, uh, and if you can scroll 
um, feel free just to sort of see a couple more the way she lays out her page. But anyway, that's just an example. That's everybody doing it. Yeah, that, that's clearly Sarah's own version of how she does a play. Um, yeah. Amazing. Uh, Emily, any any last words of wisdom or? No, we are really looking forward to reading what you are writing if you are a playwright. And, and if you aren't a playwright, if you were here uh, uh, for other reasons, we're so glad you were here. Thank you, we, we miss you. Yeah. yeah. Yes, we do miss you. And we so appreciate everyone joining us here for our first of what we are hoping will be a series of virtual engagement events. So uh, if we didn't answer your question today, uh, we will hopefully get a chance to answer it in one of our upcoming events. And please take uh, keep an eye on our social media and on our website for any announcements of future events. And I just want to say, I see a lot of you in the chat. It's so great to see you, Dama and Elizabeth and Gregor and, you know, Diana and Cappy and Bernie and, you know, Alan, you're, it's so, Bailey, hi, everyone. What a joy. I just want you to know you were also seen um, because uh, just, it's, you know, the weirdest part of this adventure is that we're like here and you guys are there, but I just want you to know you are seen and your presence is so appreciated. So thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Um, and uh, we will also be likely sending out a survey to everyone who RSVP'd to this event today uh, that will ask for a little bit of feedback on the format of what we had going on today, and then also ask you what you might be interested in seeing in future events like this. Um, so keep an eye out for that. And uh, we are so happy to have you all here with us and uh, hope to see you all again soon in person and also maybe again virtually soon. So um, stay safe and healthy and uh, that's us signing off for the day. Yes, Bye -bye. thanks everybody. Thank you.